My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership. I'm pleased and excited to introduce Armela Staley and Gomo. Raised in Madrid, the daughter of immigrants from Equatorial Guinea, Armela is now a criminal defense attorney with the Federal Defenders of San Diego. She proudly represents Latinx clients who are often undocumented immigrants and monolingual Spanish speakers. Upon graduating from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, Armela clerked for Honorable Judge Marshall, the first black woman appointed to the federal bench in the Central District of California, and the first woman chief judge for the same, whom she credits as a major inspiration for her career. She's also on the board of the Earl Gillingham Bar Association and co-chair of the Lawyers Club of San Diego Diverse Women's Committee, among many other organizations. I cannot wait to have a chat with this fascinating leader of law. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I am so excited to start this conversation with you. I want to hear a little bit more about what you do now and your journey in terms of how you got here. So talk to me a little bit about the now and how you ended up here. Sure. Um, So as you just stated, I'm a federal public defender. So that means I represent people who've been charged in federal court with committing federal criminal offenses. In federal court, that often means crimmigation, which we use kind of colloquially to combine criminal and immigration offenses. So immigrants and immigration offenses that are charged criminally. Um, Right now I'm in San Diego. So the work that we do is really driven by the border. That means that a lot of drug importation cases, smuggling of undocumented persons, and then people who are trying to enter the United States without documents or with false documents, so passport, green card, things of that nature. Um, I consider my work to be really rewarding. I think it's like a human rights type of job, civil rights type of job. Um, We're appointed to represent people who can't afford an attorney. What I really try to explain to people about our day-to-day is that we wear a ton of different hats. We're people's legal advocates, you know, in court, which is what you see in TV, but we're also therapists, social workers, mental health experts, unfortunately, drug experts. Uh, We know all about drug addiction, all about childhood trauma, all about, you know, adverse childhood experiences and kind of what got our clients to get to the point that we've been appointed to represent them in court now facing federal criminal charges. So it's work that's really intellectually stimulating. It's really personally rewarding. And it's something where we have to use all types of skills. It's not just our lawyer skills and what we learned in law school, but it's really a lot of you know person skills and understanding the individual of struggles of our clients and their families when we have to represent them in court. So what inspired you to do this work? Yeah, so as you mentioned, my family is from Equatorial Guinea. My mom is from a West African country called Equatorial Guinea. There's actually several Guineas. Um, There's New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, Guinea Guinea-Bissau, but we are from Equatorial Guinea, which is a tiny Spanish-speaking African country. Most people don't know about it. Most people don't know they're Spanish-speaking Africans. So for me, just coming from an immigrant family, knowing what it's like to live in a home where some people are citizens, some people are undocumented, some people are residents, and the unique challenges that my family faced um, being, you know, binational, speaking mostly Spanish, being from low income communities, I just knew I wanted to represent people who were part of the communities that I identified as. So Latinx, Afro-Latina, Black American, Spanish speaking, and then me personally, a second generation immigrant since my mom is the one who immigrated mm-hmm. here after uh, marrying my dad. I just wanted to give back to my community and that's how I fell into this line of work specifically. Leadership, whether you're in a corporate Fortune 100 company or in a courtroom is, is hard and it's often not very glamorous and the road is bumpy. On this podcast, what we're really intending to do is talk about those bumps and bruises. And I'm sure those bumps and bruises look a little bit different for you than they do most of the traditional corporate leaders we've had on. So I'd love to talk a little bit about your leadership journey and what are some of your lessons What do you think about when you think about those bumps and bruises? What do you think about when um, you look at where you're at today and how you got there? What are some things that stand out to you from a leadership perspective? Sure. So I'll first say that I have worked in corporate America and it was not the best fit for me personality wise, just demographically. It just, it never quite worked out. I tried it several times. I've kind of gone back and forth from public service to private practice and it's never been the right fit. And so I do feel like 
you know, I do know what that's like by contrast. And mm -hmm. so the difference in my work is that it's just so much more motivational um, and so much more like there's a passion attached to it and there's an identity attached to doing this work that's different from working in corporate America. But obviously it still takes leadership skills, and especially mm -hmm. at the federal level, there's definitely still a lot of you know, for lack of a better word, like meritocracy and a lot of boxes that I needed to check even to get here, right? I, I had to go to a good college, top law school. I did the things that I was supposed to do, like working for a clerk, uh, for a judge as a clerk, being an editor of certain journals, doing the things that would get me both into those corporate jobs that often then translate into federal public defender jobs. Mm -hmm. And then just the, the leadership skills of managing your cases and managing your clients and their expectations and their thoughts and wants and feelings and emotions to get up every day and do this work, knowing that a lot of people, I mean, literally will ask you, how can you represent those people? And knowing that for many, it's an unpopular position and role to take is something I think that takes amazing amounts of, of courage and leadership to keep doing it day in and day out. You mentioned strength of leadership. We haven't talked a lot about that on this show. What do you mean by that? How did you come to identify that as something that allows you to do your best work? For example, I had a lot of pregnant clients, a lot of pregnant women, and kind of really understanding the specific issues that they have while in custody and while they're facing a criminal justice system that others don't have and wanting to inform people how, you know, maybe a right to a family should be like a constitutional right and a right that we should all be concerned about, even if they've done something unpopular. And so just not just keeping those leadership roles and opportunities within the office, but taking leadership positions outside of the office and throughout the community so that people have a better understanding and maybe we'll support some of the things that we think will better society as a whole. Um, and that will help more people want to be a part of these types of communities and these types of leadership opportunities going forward. So what's a good example of a leadership role that you've taken in the community to further the cause of the clients that you represent? Yeah, well, just as I kind of mentioned, um, you mentioned my being a co-chair of the Diverse Women's Committee. So there's a Lawyers Club of San Diego here in San Diego, which is the Women's Bar Association. So it's a bar association for women attorneys in San Diego. Um, and we specifically, we have an annual luncheon. It's kind of a fundraiser, but also an informational luncheon where, because I'm the co-chair, I get to help pick the topic, right? And so I did use that as an opportunity to specifically talk about the barriers that pregnant women face in custody and to talk about um, sterilization um, programs, um, the right to families being unified while in custody, you know, women being shackled while they give birth in custody, and what's happening in our state prisons, our federal prisons, and at immigration detention centers throughout the border. And I kind of just use that platform to talk about the different rates that affect Black women and Black women's mortality rates and their regardless of their education levels or their profession or their finances, how they still die five to six times at a rate five to six times more than their white counterparts. And so using my platforms to help people understand the issues that I think affect me personally and people in my community, and then obviously translate to the clients who I represent too in court every day. It's very heavy work and you have to learn to separate your home life from your work life and not be consumed by it. Or we actually have a discussion about how we can experience secondary trauma because of the trauma that we're exposed to every day through our work and through our client stories. So separating your home life and your work life is a challenge for, for most folks and particularly um, COVID times, right? So what are some things that you do that have worked pretty well for you? Yeah, I mean, it's taken time and I'm not the best or good at it. Um, it's the work-life imbalance, I think, for professional mm -hmm. working parents. Uh, it's really just separating, turning off the clock, setting uh, time, you know, time parameters on my cell phone, saying, okay, I'm going to bust my butt during the week, but on Fridays... And on the weekend, I'm really going to try to cut out that time and carve out that time for myself and for my family. So what are you doing differently to improve that for the attorneys that are coming up under you, after you, around you, that are going through their same experiences that you went through early in your career? It's definitely something I talk about a lot with the new attorneys um, and, and wish people had said to me going in about carving out time for yourself 
trying your best not to work on weekends if you can, setting habits on how to stay organized and do things right when they're presented to you instead of waiting to do it so it doesn't stack up so that you're not then trying to hustle and bustle to get it down. Um, and for my line of work specifically, um, it's been to like not be angry. Um, the work that we do can, can have you very angry with the other parties because again, you're representing the underdog, not a very popular client, not a very popular situation. So telling them from the start that that's not sustainable um, and wellness and self-help and self-maintenance has to happen early. And so the sooner you get those habits under your belt, the more likely that you'll continue them and won't kind of spend your time just being angry at the system all the time and then getting burnt out because burnt out is real in any line of work. Um, but it's especially true in this specific line of work where you're always constantly fighting and it's a very adversarial system. So I, I try to, anybody who will hear me, I try to let them know about that as, as, as early as possible. When could you articulate sort of the, the anger around the systems or the consistency of the challenges or the system not improving, again, my words, not yours. Um, when did that sort of get to you where you could name it? Like angry is a very interesting word choice um, for what I think is amazing work that you do, right? Yeah, um, I, ident I mean, I identified it early on, but I identified the change when I actually stepped away from doing the work. I was a federal public defender for two years before I left to clerk with Judge Marshall. Mm. And it was really just a um, geographic thing. And when I clerked for her, her chambers was in the same building as the prosecutors. So I was forced to see them all the time, make small talk with them, talk about the weather, know them as just normal people. And I was yeah. just in a much happier place. <laughs> and I was in a much more sustainable kind of mindset by just recognizing that we're all part of the system. They're doing the work that they think leads to justice. We're doing the work that we think leads to justice. And being angry and having kind of a different temperament was not getting good results for my client and was not sustainable for me. And so it really just took taking a step back away from the work and then getting to know people more informally just because our offices were in the same location and we had to do those kind of smaller gestures of, of, of friendliness that allowed me to know that the next time I was coming back, I was no longer going to be, you know, burning the midnight oil or just feeling the way that I did the first two years when I was a more junior attorney. Yeah, that's excellent. When you think about yourself 10 years ago, um, maybe as a more junior attorney or on the cusp of, of doing the work that you're doing relative to today, what are, what are your thoughts about where you were 10 years ago and where you are today? I'm much more comfortable in my space now, um, being one of the few Black women attorneys who practice in federal court, it was difficult early on. I mean, to literally, well, to be young and Black and a woman, and so for people to assume I was a defendant, for people to assume I was a paralegal or a court reporter, um, to people just to think that I'm young or inexperienced and, and maybe shouldn't be there. The 10 years ago, me would have been much more affected by those comments and, and taken those comments to heart, whereas now I'm just much more confident in my skin and know I have that experience that even if that's assumed, I'm very happy to be the one who's there to change that assumption. What happened to get you there? So what changed? Time, age, having good results, um, the confidence of my colleagues and the confidence and warmth of my clients, even if we don't succeed um, in, you know, in the, in the way that they would have wanted to or in the way we tried. Um, and just hearing their appreciation for the work that I do, again, even if the outcome isn't necessarily what we all hoped or expected, is what just left, left me to be more confident in wanting to do this work and in wanting to continue it regardless of the battles that we face day to day in doing it. What's the advice that you could provide to people to avoid um, some of that self-doubt early in their career? I mean, overall, I just think if you pursue a line of work that you're passionate about, it doesn't feel like work or a job, and it's just something that you really are excited to do every day, you're not going to have those thoughts and you're not going to be turned away by those types of comments. Just sticking to it, knowing that you're meant to be there, knowing that you've, you know, again, done the things or faced the adversities or overcome the obstacles to get you there and reminding yourself that you're the only one that knows your personal story and know why you pursued that and know why you're there as a constant reminder. 
um, you know, whether it be corporate America, whether it be public service work, whether it be kind of a nonprofit somewhere in between, we're, we're meant to be there if it's something that we're passionate about and it's something that we work towards. So if we just keep reminding ourselves of that, I think we'll be successful no matter what we decide to do. You've mentioned a couple of times um, that your that your transition as a young black woman into the courts was challenging, not maybe not as many peers as you would like to have. Talk to me a little bit about how impactful some of the, the women that you've served under or learned from have been for you. I'd just like to hear you know some more stories around that. Absolutely. And, you know, I was just commenting yesterday as we've reached seven Black attorneys in my office. And so we're starting a Black affinity group. And for some reason, seven has been a reoccurring number. I was one of seven Black law students in my class at Berkeley Law, one of seven attorneys at the corporate law firm I worked at, Morrison Enforcer, when we at the time felt like we finally had a critical mass and developed a Black affinity group there. And then now we finally reached our critical mass of seven. I think it's probably the first time we've had seven Black attorneys at the same time. Um, And I've been here, obviously, the last year and a half with only four. It's a number that keeps happening. It's still too low of a number, but we definitely get excited when it does reach that. Many of us haven't seen or had experiences with other attorneys growing up when we've even decided to pursue this field of law. Having clerked for a judge who had so many of the first just makes you think, okay, I can do that one day. Or, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. Or, when I'm in that position, or even in the position that I'm in, I'm inspiring other women and men who look like me to do it too, because they might not have had that introduction or that bridge to know how to apply to college, how to apply to law school, and then how to do work that might be representing their communities that they might have not considered going in because it just wasn't an area that they had been introduced to when they were young. So it's helped me a lot. You know, I'd, I'd have to say that it has not been all Black women who've been my mentors. I've had several white men be my mentors. I've had several all all types of ethnicities and genders serve as my mentor. It really helps to see people, um, just Mm -hmm. visualize people who look like you in those positions when you're aspiring for them. Um, And then when they, if they can serve your mentor, it's just icing, it's just icing on the cake. How has that taken shape with you and people that are coming up around you, working with you, for you? Um, For example, how do those lessons translate? And it, all the leadership roles pretty much that I've taken on have revolved around that, have revolved around recruiting and retaining people like me in this line of work. So starting the Black Affinity Group here in my office, being on the, always being on the board of our local um, Black Attorneys Bar Associations wherever I've lived, focusing on like diverse women's, uh, diverse women attorney issues law students of color, college students of color, so that we can no longer say it's a pipeline problem. And that's why we don't have people of color in leadership positions or as attorneys are working in our office. It's like, okay, then we'll go start at the elementary school age and start talking to them and start getting them inspired to do this work so that we don't have a pipeline problem anymore. So um, really all of my efforts, if I'm gonna be taking time away from my work and my family, it's pretty much centered around that um, is just, educating, recruiting, and then retaining people of color, law students of color, primarily black and brown students to do this work, pursue legal degrees, and then give back to the community when, if and when they do decide to, to, you know, pursue this line of work similar to mine. That's a big responsibility. How do you manage all of your competing priorities? So uh, um, your day-to-day job, growing and creating this pipeline and inspiring. You also mentioned that you're a parent. That's a lot. How how does this all come together? Not very well. (laughs) Um, You know, it means sometimes missing certain events. It means working later than I would like to. It means missing bedtime, you know, sometimes, but then trying to make up for it later. You know, today is my early day that I run off to take my daughter to her tap class. At least once a week, I can commit to leaving early to do that. Um, So... Mm -hmm not well day by day it ebbs and flows taking those opportunities when there are lulls in the work or in the events to spend time with the family and and vice versa but just trying to spread ourselves as thin as possible without wearing ourselves thin is the way that I get by every day. And and again, it goes back to if you enjoy what you do, I think everybody sees that and everybody appreciates that and everybody respects the time that it takes. 
but then also, you know, making sure mom guilt doesn't overcome you too much. Um, so trying to keep that balance so that you are there and present for your family during the times when you have committed to be there for them. I'm sure your daughter sees mom kicking butt and is pretty proud and what a great model it is for her as well to see. Um, I hope so. <laughs> uh, I, I can't imagine it any other way. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So as we close, you have, you've, you've talked and you've highlighted a lot. I think, you know, um, the balance and the values and the strength of character that it takes to do really amazing work that you love all really, really important as we leave our listeners from this podcast and you have asked, want them to take away one thing, one piece of advice that you have for them, what would that be? Um, max out your 401k <laughs> the minute you start working. No. Um, Why doesn't anybody ever say that? Because you're laughing, but that is so real. I have had so many employees work for me. They've been with me for four years or three years. And they finally like, oh, I need to probably contribute to my 401k. I don't get it. I don't get it. Good advice. Well, let's stick with that. Go ahead. We will stick with that. No, definitely contribute to your 401k um, and max that out from when you're a very, you know, junior employee out of college or, or whatever it might be. So to set yourself up later in life. Um, but seriously, it's what I keep saying. And it seems simple, but unfortunately, I don't think enough of us do it is just really following your passion, really doing something don't get hung up too much on on the money or the fame or the title but if you really do something that you feel passionate about in any field um, in any line of studies in any line of work I just think you'll just live such a happier and fulfilled life um, but when you do that be careful with your finances and max out your 401k as, as early as you can so that you do have those options later in life um, to if you, you know, maybe during your working years weren't able to do it, you can pursue that philanthropy or, or whatever later in life when when you're retired and happy and able to be more diverse and and have more options in what you might want to do later on. Thank you so much for your time. I am so excited to continue to follow your journey in law, and I'm positive that we will watch your rise and appointment to the bench in years to come. Congratulations on all your great work, and I look forward to watching what comes next. Thanks, Armella. What I'm left thinking about is Armella's honest assessment of what her priorities are. How does she balance passion within her life? Passion versus priorities. Have you thought about that lately? What are they? Are there changes that need to be made? This is episode nine. Thanks for listening.